Chapter 1 Key Number 1 Total Commitment to Freedom One night when I was working for the state of Tennessee as an investigator of emergency child abuse cases, we got a call. Someone reported that their neighbor in a lower-income housing area was raising children in a filthy house. Two police officers and I headed over to investigate. The neighborhood from which the call came wasn't that bad. Some houses looked nicer than others. Some people had taken care of their lawns and driveways and gardens. Other houses were modest and worn, but not terrible. I had seen much worse neighborhoods. As we cruised down the street, searching for the right address, I began to wonder, did someone prank us? Is there really a bad situation here, or was someone playing a joke on a friend? We found the right house, pulled up in front, and my skepticism increased. The place looked completely normal for that neighborhood. It wouldn't have won any home show awards, but it didn't stand out from other houses either. The police officers and I ran our eyes over it for a moment, looking for signs of what trouble might be inside. Finally, I shrugged. Let's go check it out, I said, opening the car door. Doesn't look too bad. Maybe it won't be anything. The officers and I walked to the porch, and one of them rapped on the door with his knuckles. Their job was to stand by in case I needed backup. My job was to assess how bad the living situation was and if the children needed to be removed. From what I saw on the outside, I couldn't really envision that happening. I mentally prepared myself for a conversation with the mother, knowing I might have to be stern about some things if I saw evidence of neglect, or that I might have to apologize for the interruption if the house was in order. A woman opened the door, and a foul odor hit me like a punch in the stomach, causing me to physically recoil. Standing behind the woman were two teenage children, and behind them my eyes took in a sight almost too disgusting to believe. Dirty clothes, garbage, and piles of household items totally obscured the floor. Chairs were overturned, and the couch was functioning as one large insect hotel. Thousands of bugs in varying shapes and sizes scurried openly on walls, floors, ceiling, and furniture, and on the people themselves. It was as if the insect kingdom had taken ownership of the house, and the people were just tenants. As politely but firmly as I could, I said, I'm Nancy Alcorn from Child Protective Services. I got a call from a neighbor about living conditions here. Do you mind if I come in and have a look around? It was obvious she didn't want me to come in, but with the police present, she reluctantly stepped back to let me through. The police officers elected to stay on the porch. Our polite conversation seemed almost laughable, given how obviously bad their living situation was. Defying my gut, which was twisting with revulsion, I stepped in. The environment felt positively dangerous with pathogens, vermin, and almost overpowering smells. I'm not going to touch anything unless I have to, I thought. There's no way I'm sitting down in this place. The living room reminded me of a city dump with mounds of discarded stuff. As I approached the kitchen, swarms of bugs made way for me on the floor. Hundreds disappeared under the counters and into piles of dishes in the sink. I noticed that many of them scurried into the fridge itself. I opened the fridge to find food in various stages of decomposition, and countless roaches and insects living among the banquet, dining at will. How do they even get in there? I wondered, closing the door with an irrepressible shudder. I stepped back carefully into the living room and made my way into the hallway. A new and more repulsive smell assaulted my nasal passages. It was so bad, so acrid, that I had to will myself to move closer to the source. I followed it into a bedroom where the stench became so thick that it engulfed my other senses. There I saw a bed with a bedspread heaped on it. On the bedspread was blood and what looked like a rotting pile of yuck. The mystery substance was old enough to have dried up, but was still unbelievably nasty and emanated foulness. I pointed to the bedspread. What is that? I asked the mother, who had followed me. That's where our dog had puppies, she said. How long ago were the puppies born? A few weeks ago. I looked around. There were no dogs. It seemed that even the animals possessed enough sense to get out of this diseased, disgusting situation. In third world countries, I had visited people in mud huts whose dwellings were organized and tidy, not overrun with vermin. 
In poverty, there can be order and cleanliness, when people make the most of what they have. But this, this was far beyond what I had seen any place on the planet. I didn't know it was humanly possible to survive in this kind of filth. By now, I had seen enough. We're pulling these kids out of here tonight, I told the mother as I walked back to the front room. I cannot believe y'all are living like this. I had a few other choice words for her as well, expressing my shock at how she was raising her children and caring for herself. The children walked with me to the car without complaint. They would be placed in emergency foster care. They seemed oblivious to how unsafe their home environment was. Familiarity is a powerful and blinding force. Before getting in the car, I had the police officers shine their flashlights on me, checking for bugs. Though I hadn't sat down or so much as touched a wall, roaches and other insects were crawling on my back and hair. The officers had to pick them off and toss them away. I couldn't imagine spending a single hour in that place, let alone living there. And my heart was grieved for those kids and angry at their mom. It was the most awful living situation I have ever seen. That experience gave me a strong and graphic image of what the enemy wants to do to us. Jesus says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. See 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. But the devil is working hard to create a filthy, disgusting environment inside each of us. The devil has a vision for your life, and it's a lot worse than what I saw that night. The normal lives we lead often cover up real trouble or even filth on the inside. In Jesus' day, the religious leaders were the best-looking people of all. Their clothes were meticulously clean, their hands washed down to a science, their prayers super righteous sounding. But Jesus shocked them by calling them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. See Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. That's a pretty disgusting picture. People with lives full of stinking, rotting corpses. No wonder they couldn't stand Jesus. He shined a light on their internal ugliness. Jesus sees reality inside and out. He knew that those men were not being transformed by God's living presence, but rather were full of death. The warnings he gave them are for us as well. You and I may look good on the outside, but are we full of rotting stuff? Is there baggage we're just not dealing with? Are we sidetracked and bothered by problems and struggles? Are our lives increasingly small and hemmed in by self-imposed limitations and things we can't overcome? The outside of the house we visited that night gave no indication what was inside. I would have driven right by it without a thought. Yet inside was chaos and death. In the same way, if we look and act like Christians, that doesn't bother the enemy one bit. We can go to church and Bible studies and small groups for the next 50 years, but if our lives are chaotic and desperate and weak on the inside, he has reached his goal. What baggage are you carrying around that you haven't dealt with? Perhaps you've been avoiding it for years, but it's there, and it's not going away on its own. Jesus sounded harsh, but he was not condemning those religious leaders. He was offering them freedom. He does the same with us. Only when we see the reality of who we are will we appreciate the gift of God. Indeed, the Bible says many of those leaders turned and believed. See John chapter 12, verse 42, and so can we. The problem is that many people who try to be followers of Jesus only make a part-time commitment. Imagine being a part-time wife or husband, a part-time parent, a part-time worker who only comes in when it fits your schedule. None of those scenarios would work. In the same way, coming to Christ was designed by God to be a total commitment. It really doesn't work any other way. God made no plans for part-time Christians. There is no path for those who walk with Jesus some of the time and jump over to their own path whenever they feel like it. Those who try to have a part-time relationship with God fall into several deadly traps. Let's take a look at them. Trap number one. I don't have to go all in. The first trap is to treat salvation like a relationship of convenience. 
Lots of people see God as a buffet restaurant where you take things you like, rescue from hell, no more guilt, better friends, and leave the rest for the busboy to clean up. The Bible makes it very clear that we must go all the way with God. It's not always easy to follow Christ, but He expects a total commitment from us. We only get the benefits of walking in freedom by going all in with Him. If you have not committed your life to Christ, now is the time to do so. The rest of this book will not work for you if you do not take this step. Consider carefully and deeply the total commitment it requires. Jesus said no general goes to war without considering first if he can win the war, and no person starts to build a tower unless he is sure he can finish it. See Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 33. He was calling people to consider the magnitude of the commitment they were making. Then he invited them to, as Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 says, follow me.